won't fail. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Oh, hallelujah. We lift our voice. Hallelujah. We unite our hearts together, Father. And we set our sights upon you. And we look to you and we look at you because we have built our lives upon you. Everything that we have and everything that we are and everything that we have ever done and everything that we will ever do is all based upon you, centered on you. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to God forevermore. Thank you that you've given us your word and you have given us your spirit and you've given us each other. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you, Father God, that Jesus is building this thing and the gates of hell are not prevailing against us. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You will never fail. Hallelujah. And we will not fail to receive from you. We will receive with an open heart. Oh, Father God, we rejoice. Ah, hallelujah. We rejoice this morning for Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Well, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Let's just get into this thing. Spiritual ignorance of choice. And it comes right down to it. <clears throat> you have a God-protected right <clears throat> to make some choices in life. And that is true for all of you in all of your circumstances. We having the same spirit of faith, we having the same spirit of faith, we believe and therefore we speak. Eventually, if you listen to yourself, you're gonna find, you're gonna find out just what you believe by what comes out of your mouth. And some of us are not all of that in a bag of chips, we think we are, but when the moment of pressure or crisis comes and we crumble, the Bible says, how small is your strength? in the day of adversity, in the day of trouble and pressure, and when you find yourself just caving in quickly, that is an indicator for you. That is not condemnation. That is not for you to, that is not for you to feel bad about yourself. That is a place for you to identify where you are and say, wait a minute, I, I, need, to, I need to strengthen my faith in this area. I need to spend more time in the Word. I need to, I need to spend more time being immersed and saturated in His presence. Because I got a bad report or I got a hint of something or this happened or that happened and I absolutely positively did not like the fact that I collapsed and caved and crumbled. And so we have to get used to the idea that stress and pressure and problems are here to stay. I mean, it's not ever going to go away. The Bible teaches us that it's going to get worse. You have to prepare yourself for the fact that the Bible tells you it is going to get worse. It is not going to get better. Your little prayer time and your little confessions are not going to make an ultimate difference in what happens with this world system. It is corrupt, it is evil, and it is on its way into hell. Now, you can back things up out of your life, back things uh, away from you. You can claim exemption. You can, you can have protection over your family, over your church, over your... You can have protection right in the midst of it. But notice that Jesus told us that he sets the table before us right in the presence of our enemies while they're all around, while they're looking on. Instead, people are focused on the enemies, they're looking at the enemies and they're thinking, oh my God, I can't be happy under these conditions. I, I can't be satisfied with all these enemies around me. What are we going to do? We better bind each one of them. We better call them out by name. And he said, wait a minute, I've set that table before you, not in the absence of your enemies, but in the presence. He said, in the presence of mine enemies. Whew, man, he doesn't even tell you to back the enemies up. He just said, sit down at the table. <laughs> right in the darkness, right in the pain, right in the suffering, right in the grief and agony. Just sit down and eat. <laughs> One day you're going to get that. One day the revelation of that is going to dawn on you and you're going to be like, huh. You mean I've been wasting all this time focusing in on the enemies? 
You mean I've been wasting all of my time going to every spiritual war conference trying to figure out how to do battle with these enemies who are all defeated. They are defeated foes, and yet they stand there and they mock you. And you know what they're mocking you to do? Here's what they're mocking you to do. Pay attention to me. I'm an enemy. Focus on me, because I'm going to get you. He won't, because he can't. He's been defeated. This is one of the great tragedies of the ages, is that we're spending more time trying to figure out how to overcome a defeated foe instead of sitting at the table and taking our rightful place. If I had a friend in here, I'd get a little amen. <clears throat> this is crazy stuff, man. This is crazy stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm just, let me just get, let me get my Bible open and get, get going on this. Matthew, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. That's what the enemy is there doing, is trying to get you to focus on him instead of the table. The enemy is trying to get you, child of God, to focus on him instead of the table. The enemy is trying to get you to focus on him instead of the table. The enemy, Satan, and all of his cohorts are defeated foes. Jesus defeated them thoroughly. Do you realize that they have no say-so over your life, over your family, over your health? They have no say-so regardless of what it looks like. The problem is people have the right to choose and they are walking in the reality of those choices, good or bad. Why does this keep happening to me? Because you're a dummy, that's why. Tell them I said that too. Because you're making terrible decisions and choices. Because you're speaking wrong, you're thinking wrong, and you're acting wrong, and then you're shaking your fist at God, and you're saying, why didn't you help me? And God's going to say, why didn't you watch your words? I told you death and life were in the power of your tongue. Why didn't you keep careful guard over your thought life? I told you that you can prove out my good, acceptable, and perfect will for your life if you will renew your mind with my word. See, we, we want to get all clever and cute and try to blame somebody. Br blame the preacher. Blame the church. Blame God. Br blame the government. And, and really, the reality of it is that the Christian has nobody to blame but himself or herself. Dear God, I mean, you're not just the temple. You are the whole embassy on this earth. I mean, self-contained glory apparatus. That means that you can go into hell itself and the toxic fumes of hell will not penetrate and hurt you because you are breathing of the glory of God. So in chapter 10, in verse 1, Jesus called unto him his 12 disciples, chapter 10, verse 1 in Matthew's gospel. And he gave their pastor power. No, he gave them power against unclean spirits to do what? To cast them out. Not to debate, not to argue, not to look for their name, but simply to cast them out and to heal some manner of sickness and some manner of disease. You have to stop listening to the medical profession when they tell you, well, this is terminal. There's no cure for this. Gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Evidently, poor old Jesus didn't know that there was going to be some manner of sickness and disease you couldn't do anything about. Poor old Jesus didn't know that. Well, he wasn't as educated then as we are today, Pastor. We know a lot more today. We have the Mayo Clinic. Verse 7, And as you go, he said to them, the kingdom, he said, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, 
Cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Where the heck is the church today? There is no church today that I am aware of that has this as their marching orders. And yet here it is right here in verse 8. Same thing. Luke's going to record this for us. Let me show you how Luke uh, puts it in here for us. Matthew, Mark, Luke. I, I am not in a very tolerant mood today. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I guess when you go through wave after wave of grief and misery and heartache, and you see things you can't unsee, you don't have time for games. I don't have any time for games anymore. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. It's been a long time, and, I, and, and I'm here to tell you that this is the end of all things. And that the end of all things means that we don't retreat and cower. This is when we press on and press on hard. And the only thing that I have is the word of God. That's the sword of the spirit. If you've noticed about the, the, the armor, the armor of God, there's only one offensive weapon, and that is the sword of the word of God. Everything else is for defense, the shield of faith. That's important because the Bible says you can extinguish all the fiery darts, flaming arrows that come at you. He wouldn't tell you you needed that if there were no flaming arrows coming at you. Instead, we're focused on the flaming arrows. Why do these keep coming? When will it stop? It won't. It won't. But he won't fail you. Because the sword of the Spirit is sharper than any two-edged sword. There's nothing like it, guys. But you've got to get this thing down into your heart and speak it out of your mouth. You can't just keep it up here in mental ascent mode. Oh, I've read the Bible. Oh, oh I know that Bible verse. It ain't going to do you no good. That's like keeping a sword in its sheath and never pulling it out and start slicing and dicing. That's like keeping ammo in the gun and never pulling it out of the holster and pulling a trigger. This thing is locked and loaded, baby. This thing can do the job. But it has to be put into the human heart and spoken out of the human mouth. We think it's just magically going to work. Like we lay, we lay it on the coffee table like, oh, work your powers in my house. I don't hear you. I don't hear you talking. No, that's because that's your job. Luke says this in chapter 9, verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together. He gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. This is Luke 9, 1, talking about, talking about what Jesus sent his disciples to do. And he told us, by the way, that we are sent to do the same works that he did. So you're not excluded from this. You're not exempt from this. You don't get a free a pass out of this. He said, over all devils and to cure diseases. And in verse 2, he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Verse 6, and they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. What did they do? They preached the gospel and they healed everywhere. They preached the gospel and they healed everywhere. Chapter 10 of Luke's gospel. <clears throat> and in verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. And in verse 9, he said, and heal the sick that are therein. Watch, he said, heal the sick that are therein. And he said unto them, you tell them the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Wait a minute, is this a new concept, Pastor? We've not heard this before. You mean get the sick healed and then tell them? The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. You mean demonstrate and manifest first? And then tell them this is the kingdom of God in manifestation. This is a demonstration of the kingdom of God. You don't think for one minute 
You don't think for one minute that this is not the most effective way to evangelize? Get people healed first? You don't think, they're, you don't think that if you can get them healed first, you don't think for one minute that they're not going to want to hear what you have to say about Jesus, right? Because if you get them healed first, and I'm not talking about little headaches and splinters and, and stubbed toes. I'm not talking about that because that's not what we're talking about here. You go in there, you get people healed while you are out there in your community, in your place of employment, in your marketplace, wherever you are, wherever you go, you are the embassy of the kingdom of God. And as far as God is concerned, every man, woman, boy and girl has been set free by the sacrifice of Jesus already. Now you have to go and manifest it and demonstrate it and then say to them, hey, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. And if I'm misreading this, please tell me. Maybe your Bible says something else. But, I, but I'll just take a, a little jab at this and say, I think all of your Bibles pretty much say the same thing. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom is... Well, that's... Pastor, that's not fair. These are modern times. This was Bible days. When Jesus said this, they didn't even have a copy of the Bible that you do. When Jesus said this, there was no Beacon Hill Assembly God Church. There was no Assembly of God. There was no Pentecostal. There was no Methodist. There was no Catholic. There was no Presbyterian, Episcopal. There was none of that. There was just Jesus telling them this is what you're to do. Well, okay. And in verse 17, the 70 returned again with joy, said, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Verse 19, behold, I give unto you power, authority, power, authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Wow. You mean we're empowered and authorized? To accomplish the purpose for which we've been sent? Yep. The trouble today is that the church doesn't know the purpose for which she has been sent. We create wonderful worship experiences. I'm going to tell you this until Jesus comes. I'm going to tell you that this is the problem. What are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? I'll tell you what we're doing wrong. We're creating these elevated worship experiences for people to be so comfortable and so happy when they come to church. In fact, you ought to be miserable right now. Because you ought to be doing what I'm doing up in here. You ought to be saying, I don't measure up. I don't measure up. I better do something about this. Yeah, you better do something about this. And don't do this. Because that's what we're good at. We're good at blaming or shifting responsibility or reasoning or rationalizing or debating it away. This, see, Pastor, you're getting a little carried away now. This is a different time. No, I'm telling you, this is the time that we're living in now. The church doesn't look anything like this. Nothing like it. And every once in a while when you have a revival service or an evangelistic uh, meeting and, and things happen, once in a great while we go, whoa, you missed it, man. We had a great service. I'm so glad that dude comes through once a year, baby. Woo! Signs, wonders, and once a year. How about once, once a lifetime for most churches? Well, if it's God's will, it'll happen here. We having the same spirit of faith. Now, just in case you think I'm stretching things a little bit, I'm going to remind you of John 14 again. We've got a job to do. There's a purpose for our existence, and it is not for you to have an enhanced worship experience. You're going to John chapter 14. The purpose, the reason for your existence, for my existence, for this church's existence, is not to compete with other members of the body of Christ and see who can outdo the next church with a more enhanced worship experience, with, with new and improved fog machines and really, really big screens. That's not what this is about. This is baloney, folks. This is absolute nonsense as far as I can tell. We're just, all we're doing is we're just, all of us, we're just basically fishing out of the same pond. 
and we are recycling the saints. That's all we've been doing. And in the meantime, there are people right now who are lost and going to hell. And we're fighting over fog machines and skinny jeans and, and we're competing with this one and that one. Well, this one's got more money, so they're going to get the job done. What, what job are they getting done? They're not advancing the kingdom of God. <sighs> so in, in John chapter 14, Jesus made this very, very clear. I don't know that there is a more obnoxious, irrational thing that Jesus said. He's got, he's got some nerve. In fact, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, maybe this was misinterpreted and it wasn't recorded correctly for us. This must have been a fanatic zealot who translated this for us. Because I, I, this is just too much. So in ch verse 6, Jesus said, this is chapter 14, I am the way. I am the way. I'm not one of the ways. I, I don't know the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I'm not going to lead you to truth. I am the truth and the life. No man, no human being comes to the Father but by me. Now that, that pretty much, that'll offend everybody out there. You people are all exclusive in your doctrine. Yep, we are. Verse 6 is very exclusive. You're very narrow-minded. Yep, we are. I'm extremely narrow-minded when it comes to the way, the truth, and the life. You're not open to other people's opinions. Nope. You're not open to hear, hearing my theory. Nope. You're not even open to debating verse 6. No. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Nobody comes to the Father but by him. Period. End of discussion. If it offends you, if it's hateful, if it's divisive, deal with it. Philip said uh, in verse seven, uh, verse 7, if you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father <laughs> and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said, what? Have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the father and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Get ready for the most obnoxious, unrealistic, Craziest thing that Jesus has ever said in his life. You ready? Verily, verily, truly, truly. I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Are you out of your mind? Are you kidding? How am I going to do the works that Jesus did? And more than that, how am I supposed to do greater works? You must be out of your mind. You must be out your Jewish mind. I don't know about you folks, but this is meant to jack you up. This is meant to shake you to your core and get you to see that perhaps just maybe all these years later, we have never reached that level. And all we're doing is playing pretend and make believe. That's all we're doing. We're competing with one another. We're enhancing the worship experience. We're building bigger buildings. We're building bigger barns. We're dressing in fashionable clothes. We're acting just like the world. We're getting cute and clever and hip, baby. Come on in. Drink your Starbucks. Heck, get rid of the pews. Let's set up these bistro tables. I ain't even going to have a pulpit no more. I'm going to sit up here on a stool, man. I'm going to have me some ripped jeans and I'm telling you what, I'm going to pump some weights and I'm going to shrink my shirts, baby. Woo! And verse 12 is still staring us in the face. Well, Lord, didn't we brew Starbucks in your name? Well, Lord, didn't we wear tight skinny jeans in your name to glorify you? Let me tell you something. You ain't glorifying nobody but you when you strut around up here and do that. 
You're not glorifying anybody but you when you have to have an enhanced worship experience because Jesus don't need nobody enhancing nothing. He is the way, the truth, and the life. If you will glorify him and honor him and if you will operate in the same power and glory that he did, you don't need no fog machines. He said the same works if you do what? What's the qualifier here, folks? He said, verse 12, he that believeth on me. Do you believe? Are you a believer? Go home and look in the mirror and say, hey there, believer. Daydream believer. I'm a believer. And according to verse 12 of chapter, according to verse 12 of chapter 14, he, Jesus said, because I'm a believer, I'm going to do the same works he did and greater. The trouble is, I don't believe it. I don't believe this because if I did, I'd have more results. It's either so or it isn't. Is this the truth or not? Have you put verse 12 in a category all by itself like the rest of the word? That is the standard. That is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Do you know that Jesus is the living word, the word made flesh? If he spoke this, that is the truth. And if I'm not doing that, then it means that I do not believe to the degree that I need to to have these results. Man, I'm telling you, I ought to walk around like I am somebody. I am locked and loaded. I am locked and loaded. When I speak, when I speak God's word out of my mouth, there's no difference than when Jesus himself speaks it out of his mouth. Because I am one with him. He said, because I go unto my father. Now, watch verse 13. <laughs> and whatsoever you shall ask. That word ask actually means to demand or call for. And whatsoever you shall demand or call for in my name, that will I do. That your resume may be glorified and your congregation will grow big and fat and you'll have lots of bank accounts and offshore accounts overflowing with money. If you shall ask, demand, call for anything in my name, I will do it. Well, who are you demanding? Who are you calling for? You're not, you're not demanding God. Are you nuts? You don't demand God. But you can demand circumstances and devils. He just said, I've given you power and authority over all devils, over all diseases. You can demand and call for your rights and you can speak to demons and devils and command them to go. You don't sit down and have tea and crumpets with them. Tell us your name. You tell them what they're going to do. You command, you command anxiety to go. You tell depression it has to go. You demand aneurysm to disappear. You tell cancer what it has to do. Don't just lay there and accept it and say, well, if God wants me well, he'll heal me. What an insult. Whatever you demand, whatever you call for, whatever you ask, he said, I will do this thing. I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. This is all about glorifying him. He paid such a horrific price and we're playing little patty cakes down here. We have been given authority and power. Those were the opening references that I gave you. Do you honestly think that we have less authority and power than the disciples did? Think about this. In Matthew and in Luke... When Jesus said, I've given you power and authority, do you know that those disciples were not yet born again? That they were still spiritually dead on the inside? That they hadn't received the life of God? And here we are today, brand new creations, and we're acting like they had more power and authority then. Folks, we got this thing mixed up. You're in a place right now where they have longed to see and longed to experience like, oh my God, you saints now, you have it made. You got this thing made, you don't even know it because you're whining and crying because you're too busy looking at the enemies all around that table. You're too busy looking at, at the enemies and worrying about them. And it's like Jesus is just telling you, will you please just sit down? Sit down and just eat from what I've given you and provided for you. Now, 
Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not putting this pressure on you to make you feel guilty and overwhelmed. I'm just telling you guys, if we will allow him, he will elevate us to a place of sonship that we have only dreamed possible. Elevate you to a place where, wow, wow, this is a pretty good place to be in. There's so much peace, there's so much joy, there's so much fulfillment and contentment that you can actually let loved ones go on and say, I'll see you soon. I'll continue. I will continue to run this race. I ain't backing up off of this thing. If anything, every time I have to let somebody go, it fuels this fire in me like nothing does. It's like, really? It, it just does something to me because, wait a minute, <laughs> we've come too far now to back up. Glory to God. Acts chapter 10, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I hope you're paying attention or taking notes or at least go back and listen to this because this is good stuff. Stop acting like, stop talking like, stop thinking like the disciples had it better than you because they didn't. We couldn't handle the, the persecution, the intense persecution and the opposition at the beginning. We couldn't handle it. What makes you think you're ready to handle it at the end, folks? Church needs to toughen up. Stop playing these little games. This, this, is, this is the heart of the message here is that you're heading into some rough seas. I hope you got your Dramamine and Bonine. <laughs> I hope you know how to secure everything. Things are going to be shaking and bouncing everywhere. But he won't fail you. He won't. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, we're told this. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. In this verse alone, verse 38 of Acts chapter 10, it tells you who does the healing and who does the oppressing. It tells you this. And it also tells you who is responsible for helping the oppressed. It also shows you that the God, the entire Godhead worked and is continuing to work against demonic oppression. God the Father anointed God the Son with God the Holy Ghost so that God the Son could go around and do good and heal all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. If this verse is confusing to you and vague, it's because the devil is keeping you blinded to the truth. And you need to ask God to help you because this will solve everything. Right here. The entire God had working against oppression. The entire God had working against oppression. That, is the will of, that was the will of God then. That is the will of God today. And he has given us the same equipment, the same empowerment to accomplish the same purpose. He does it through the body of Christ today. That's us. We are anointed with the same Holy Ghost and with power. We should be going around doing good and healing all that are oppressed of the devil. Instead of preaching to them, well, it might be God's will to heal you. You never know his mysteries to perform. That's baloney. That's nonsense. That's not gospel. That's not gospel. That's not gospel at all. And then just so that we can wrap this thing up for today, because you got a lot to chew on. <clears throat> In Mark chapter 16, uh, after Jesus had uh, uh, came back from the dead, uh, verse 12, he appeared, uh, this is chapter 16, Mark's gospel, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country, verse 13, and they went and told it unto the residue, neither believe they them. <laughs> verse 14, afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and he apologized for being so hard with them and for putting them in a predicament in an emotional frenzy. And uh, he just said, guys, I hope you can forgive me. I know it's been really tough and emotional for you lately, and, and I hope that you'll find it in your hearts to forgive me. I'll try to do a better job next time. 
No, it, the Bible says he upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. I wonder what unbelief and hardness of heart you have today. And I wonder what Jesus would say to you today about it. Don't, don't, look, don't look and say, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't hate me because you ain't me. All these dumb, stupid things that come, that the church uses now. It's like, folks, I don't care what you say. Jesus didn't mess around with unbelief and hardness of heart, and neither should you. If you got a problem, you better straighten it out. You need to say, Lord, I got a problem. I see the standard in the word of God, and I refuse, I refuse to bring myself up to that level because I got my own personal theology and I got my own personal prejudice and I got my own interpretation. And I don't care, Bible or no Bible, there ain't no way I'm going to do the same works that you did, Lord. Who are we kidding here? Don't tell me you ain't thought that. Don't tell me somebody you know hasn't thought that. Because every time I preach some of this stuff, man, you can just feel like a... Houston, we got a problem. Come up off that break, man. Come up off that break. Sometimes you just need to learn how to put the thing in neutral, and I'll push you into it. What do you think, I'm going to push you over a cliff? After all this time, you don't know that you can't trust me? That my heart is for you? And so here he says to them, because they believe not, he said, verse 15, he said unto them, go into all the world and preach some version of the gospel to every creature. Hmm. I love the fact that when he said this to them, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, at this point in time, we didn't have all the religious factions then that we have today. In fact, when he says this, there were no other brands of Christianity. There was only one brand, one variety, and it got you killed, and it got you kicked out of your family. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Let me tell you something, what he's telling them. This is a death sentence for you. You're going to preach this gospel? Okay. That's why I'm telling you, you better, you better buckle up. If we're going to preach this thing, it's not going to be easy because the world is getting less tolerant and, in fact, will turn on us. And it's already happening now that you don't have a right to have a different opinion, that you don't have a right to see things differently than they do, whatever that mainstream thought process is that they're, they're vomiting on us. And I'm telling you, the same gospel then is still the same gospel today. He said, verse 16, he that debates and rationalizes and reasons and thinks maybe perhaps there might be some virtue or merit. Yeah, right. He said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Watch. But he that believeth not shall be damned. There's the saved and there's the damned. There's the saved and there's the damned. You're either saved or you're damned. You're either saved or you're damned. There's no in between. That's it. It's always been that way. Which are you? Now, I am sure you want your loved ones over here with the saved group. But don't judge them. Can't judge them. Yeah, okay, right. I can judge the fruit, can't I? Verse 17, here we go. Now he's going to mess us up again. I was doing okay for the moment, and then he had to throw this in here. And these signs maybe might somehow, some way, follow them that go to an accredited Bible college. No, he said, these signs shall, they will, absolutely, positively follow them that believe. There's that stinking believe business again. Do I believe? Well, if I do, Gary... Gary, because I'm talking to Gary, you could listen in. If I really believe, watch this. Jesus said, hey, Gary, you say you're a believer. Yes, sir. Well, then in my name, you're going to cast out devils. That's scary, Lord. I thought you needed an authorized exorcist to do that. Hmm. Jesus said, if you believe. Then he says in verse 18, well, now he's going to really jack you up. If you believe, 
you're going to take up serpents. I ain't touching no snakes. Well, he's not talking about literal snakes. Come on. And if you drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt you. Huh. And what else? If you believe, Gar, you'll lay hands on the sick. And if it's God's will, they will recover. Aren't you happy to know that that verse does not say, if it's the will of God, they will recover. Let me, let me, let me just encourage you. If you're having trouble believing, if you're having trouble feeling like this is the standard, and you just, if you're having trouble and you know that you're fighting yourself with it, meditate on this, this one phrase, until, until you actually believe that Jesus is telling you the truth. I'll read it to you. That last part of verse 18. They shall lay hands on the sick. Who shall, if you believe, the believer? If you lay hands on the sick, the Bible says they, the sick, shall recover. It doesn't say, if it be my will, they'll recover. Take that out of your thinking. So, verse 19, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and he sat on the right hand of God, and what did they do in verse 20? And they went forth and competed with other churches. No, nope, they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now, in conclusion, because I think you've had enough to think about. That verse right there, verse 20. I'm going to point something out to you. There is a word that is italicized in verse 20. The word them is italicized, which means that this was not in the original. This was added by the translators. Them, okay, for clarification. However, if we take that word them out of there, you will read it this way. Verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with and... Watch this, the Lord working with and confirming the word with signs following. The Lord is working with and confirming the word. And it is so imperative and vital that you preach the gospel so that he can work with and confirm that word. The reason things are not happening is because we are giving people a watered down version or an adulterated version or a perverted, carnal, secular version, God is not going to confirm that because that's not his gospel. But if you will preach the word of God in all of its boldness, in all of its power, in all of its glory, God will work with and confirm that word with signs following. Amen. That's why we got to get back to preaching the gospel. Hard, man. Preach it hard with passion. Let God confirm this thing. I'll tell you another little secret is that if we will have a church full of people who don't yet know the power of God and know the Lord, you'll see a lot more stuff popping in here. But you guys are believers. You're children of God. Certain things aren't going to keep happening week after week. But if you will keep bringing new people in who don't yet know the power of God and know our, know our Lord, you'll see some signs popping. I promise you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We having the same spirit of faith as who? As Jesus himself. As the early church. We having the same spirit of faith as Paul the Apostle. We having the same spirit of faith as John Wesley. We having the same spirit of faith as Smith Wigglesworth. John G. Lake. We having the same spirit of faith as T.L. Osborne. Some of these amazing men of God men and women of God, who operated in such power and passion. We have that same spirit of faith, but the Bible tells you what you have to do. You have to believe and speak out of your mouth. Speak. Sickness and disease may not stay in my presence. It can't. It can't. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, the Bible tells me that I have authority and power, and I'm going to take authority over every foul, evil spirit. Every spirit of infirmity, every lying devil, you won't manifest in my presence. I'm sorry, you can't manifest in my presence. <laughs>